And I think the north can be viewed as uh, the canary in the coal mine. And we're seeing changes happening now. It's not uh, speculation, it's not theory. It's happening now. In my lifetime, I've seen the warming of uh, the planet and the, and the changes that result from that. It used to be ice in Great Slave Lake in July. We haven't seen that for the last 10 years. For us, uh, Denny, this is our homeland. Uh, it's always been our homeland. We've been in this area for thousands of years. We know this land. Until recently, uh, there was no need to manage people on these lands. So there was no pressure. But since the 1990s, when diamonds were discovered up here, the largest stake in mankind's history was done here. And that put some pressure on the land and the animals. And anything that happens to the environment is always a great concern to, to us and, uh, that rely on, on the land for food, food security, cultural identity, and so on. The Keicho territory, it's a huge territory. It's uh, 400,000 square kilometers. The relationship with Ducks Unlimited is giving as much information on those, that territory as possible. Getting a snapshot of what the Keicho territory looks like. And using that information, we will make decisions on land use plans, on possible protected areas or special management zones. Ducks Unlimited and its mandate is consistent with, uh, with the Dene and the Dene relationship with the land. So there's commonalities there. As Dene, we think long term. We think long term and we try to action uh, what we think is going to be best in the long term. Land and culture and identity are interwoven. They're one and the same. By assuming the responsibility of the land again, you, you retake your culture, your identity. This is about the, taking responsibilities to create the balance again. Well, good evening and welcome everyone to the seventh Ducks Unlimited Canada Marsh Masterclass. For those of you who are returning, and I see many of you uh, are familiar to our Marsh Masterclass, welcome back. If this is your first masterclass, we're very glad that you've decided to join us. And if you've missed a previous episode, the link to the YouTube video series will be posted in the chat tonight. And it was also included in your invitation to this event. So what a fabulous video to get us started tonight. The Boreal is a beautiful and diverse area and the size and, and vastness of it never ceases to amaze me. Um, Unfortunately, the analogy about it being the canary is, is pretty accurate as we're gonna uh, dig into a little bit tonight. So I recognize many of the faces and names tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cynthia Edwards. I'm the Chief of Major Gift Programs for Dex Unlimited Canada. And I also work cross-border with our wonderful partners in the US and Mexico, many of whom are great supporters of our work in the Boreal Forest. So thank you for joining tonight. All of you, our volunteers, partners, major donors are essential to keeping our conservation machine running. And that running continues despite the challenges we've had this past year. So thank you for all of your continued support. One of my favorite things about the DU family is that it enables us to be part of something that's much bigger than ourselves and much bigger than our backyards. And that's truly a special opportunity. So a couple housekeeping items before we get started tonight. All of you are on mute. We do have a couple breaks for questions throughout the evening. You can either uh, type your question into the chat and I can read it for you. Or if you want to uh, be unmuted to ask your question, just let us know that in the chat as well. Also, I'm obligated to let you know that we're recording the event tonight. So please be on your best behavior. So I wanted to begin tonight by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands we are on. Even though we meet on Zoom today, I'd like to acknowledge the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations as the original caretakers of this land and encourage each of you to identify the traditional and unceded territories and where applicable treaties that you live and work within. 
At DU Canada, we recognize our responsibility as a conservation organization towards building and strengthening meaningful and respectful relations with Indigenous peoples and raising our own understanding and awareness of those histories, traditions, and culture. I'm with you tonight from my home in Madison, Mississippi, which is the traditional homeland of the Choctaw. So tonight we're going to learn more about the diverse work that we do across Canada's boreal forest because most of the land in this area is public land with multiple government jurisdictions, provincial, territorial, First Nations and federal. The work we do there is much different than some of our more traditional uh, programs in Southern Canada where we work a lot with private landowners. So we had some great feedback on the panel discussion we did on the last Mars Ma Marsh Masterclass that was focused on the ag sector, and we wanted to continue that format. So tonight we're bringing you a little bit of a hybrid program. We'll start with a short presentation by Kevin Smith. Kevin is the National Manager of Boreal Programs for Ducks Unlimited Canada. He started his DU journey in California, where he expanded wetland mapping products to the boreal regions of Canada and that experience gave him a really deep appreciation for the boreal forest and ultimately led to a secondment to Ducks Unlimited Canada and uh, for the last eight years he's been managing the boreal program for us. So he'll tell us a little bit about the boreal in general, the importance of it to continental waterfowl populations, and then about the program that we do in the area. Then we'll move into more of a, a panel discussion with Kevin and two of his colleagues who work with him in the Boreal program, Al Richard and Bev Gingras. So Al is a graduate of the University of Lethbridge and Lethbridge Community College, and he joined us right out of school and has been with us for 33 years. And we had an interesting conversation earlier tonight about his collection of Ducks Unlimited Canada and DU Inc. stamps. So uh, Al's capacity over the years has included delivering habitat programs, managing the remote sensing and GIS program for the boreal. And over the past few years, he's led the boreal conservation partnerships and the fee for service components of that program. Al is an active volunteer with Ducks Unlimited Canada. And like many of us enjoys the outdoors with his spouse and family. Bev is the head of uh, boreal conservation program. And since joining our national boreal program in 2012, She's worked with her colleagues to mobilize science-based wetland and waterfowl knowledge into practical application by those who manage land in Canada's boreal region. Outside of her work with Ducks Unlimited Canada, you'll find Bev riding her mountain bike, working in her garden, or trying to play the ukulele. So Bev and Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Bev's gonna kick us off with a, a quick question and then we'll be on to uh, the presentation by Kevin. Thank you, Cynthia. So um, we're just going to start off with uh, just a quick question. Um, can you see my, my screen? Great. And we'd like you to just to think about the first kind of word or the first three words. You can, you can do it three times if you like. That pops into your head when you think about uh, the boreal forest. Um, just to get you know, a warm up to thinking about the boreal forest and what you know. And then Kevin's going to give his presentation, and then we'll we'll revisit what everybody, you know, had to say when they're thinking about about the boreal forest. And we've already got some black flies again. Seems to be <laughs> the one thing that people think of. So, so I'll turn it over to Kevin, and then we will um, revisit this after his presentation. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, to, as we talk about boreal conservation and the, the incredible opportunity that, that we have in our, the northern parts of, of our country here. So with, I think we'll, we'll find out the results of the, of the menti, Mentimeter here, here quickly, but I think that the first thing that, that comes up to me is just the, the incredible vastness of, of the boreal. It stretches from, from coast to coast to coast, uh, and in North America stretches around 1.5 billion acres uh, all the way ac across the country. And I'll talk about a little bit about some of the important pieces within that. So within Canada, it's about 1.2 billion acres. And for the most part, uh, especially in the northern parts of it, it's largely intact. And it's one of the 
largest remaining intact areas, uh, forested areas on the planet. Critically important for a number of things, including uh, carbon st storage and sequestration, uh, clean water, a bunch of other things. It also holds uh, an incredible amount of wetlands, which are obviously of, of a lot of importance to Ducks Unlimited. 85% uh, of Canada's remaining wetlands are in the boreal and over a quarter of the world's wetlands uh, exist within the boreal. And in, in addition to wetlands, there's also a lot of fresh water, uh, around 200 million acres of it uh, within the boreal. It's also a, a very important place for, for waterfowl, for wildlife and other biodiversity. And it's also uh, home to over 600 communities of, of indigenous peoples across the country with a, incredible spiritual and cultural significance. It's also really important to birds. Uh, nearly half of the continental breeding waterfowl populations as shown by the, the latest surveys coming out of the, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service are coming from uh, the boreal region. Many places spread out in medium to low densities, but in aggregate, uh, critically important to, to our waterfowl populations. Over 23 species of ducks breed in the boreal and somewhere around 1.1 1 .1 to 3 million billion migratory birds come and fly through all four migratory pathways to wintering grounds in, in the southern regions. There are also the waterfowl surveys are showing that Although most of, of the populations are, are increasing, there are some that are decreasing like the scop and also scoters. It also provides a lot of important, uh, not only breeding, but also brood rearing and staging habitat for waterfowl as they fly south. So what are, the, what are some of the important things of, about conservation in the boreal? How do we, how do, we do that? So in the boreal, 90% of it is, is public land, crown owned or, or indigenous owned um, across the, the entirety of the boreal. So really what we do is large scale policy or influence those types of things. Um, and early on industry and governments were making a lot of the, the land use management decisions and regulations. And while that's still true, uh, a number, this has shifted increasingly towards uh, indigenous management uh, and co-management across the country. Th because we're looking at large area influence, we have three main approaches that, that we work through. One is, is protect areas outright. And in areas that we can't protect, we, we employ sustainable land use approaches which Bev will talk about a little bit more in more detail later, uh, basically ways that we can operate not only a healthy environment, but also a healthy economy um, through industrial aspects of the landscape as well. And we also work on conservation and wetland policies across the country. And we also have pieces that uh, we were grounded in science. So we have a, a research component that we have uh, communications and also a bunch of conservation support products that we have. I think one of the, the, the major things that, that we bring uh, to conservation is, is our team. Conservation in the boreal starts with a good team and here is the, the team at one of our retreats. The other thing that we've learned about boreal conservation is that we can't do it alone. Partnerships are, are incredibly important to, to doing anything in the boreal because it's, it's, it's influence. Working in collaborative partnership-based approach is the only way that we feel that conservation can be advanced together in, in the boreal. And it's, it's proven to be the most effective way to approach conservation. While waterfowl are important to Ducks Unlimited Canada, our partners are often invested in other values like clean water, wildlife habitat, or safeguarding biodiversity. We've invested a considerable amount of time 
in long-term sustained relationships in the boreal with indigenous communities and governments, industry, researchers, governments, and other important stakeholders. And we're most effective when we leverage these important partnerships towards our common goals uh, to influence a greater amount of conservation in this important landscape for all of us. These are some of the, the agreements that we have with working with an indigenous uh, these are chiefs of the Akecho. In, within the Akecho territories, we rolled out some of our wetland inventories. Um, this is in Lutzelke, where they were, uh, they have recently signed um, uh, Canada's newest national park into existence, which is also an indigenous protected area, Tai Dene Nene. The other thing that we've learned is that we need to prioritize where we work. Given the limited resources that we have in, over such a vast area, one of the, the important things that, that we've done is to prioritize where, where we work and where, where we uh, invest our staff time and resources, uh, including in, in areas of, of high waterfowl and, and wetland density. And this map is, is one of the maps that we use to, to help guide uh, where we work across the boreal. And the purple areas are shown as the, the kind of top 40% of the waterfowl habitat within, uh, this is keyed into the Western boreal. So how do we do this? What, what types of things do, does do you do uh, in, in terms to, to advance conservation within the boreal? We have a range of conservation products and services that we support. Um, other, other partners in, in their land management and land use decision and policies that govern areas within the boreal. We have a fairly extensive GIS and, and remote sensing team that you know every once in a while we do get out of the office and, and go out on the land and work with our partners to collect information on where the wetlands and the waterfowl are across the boreal. We get to fly in, in airplanes and helicopters to collect this information and it allows us to produce really highly accurate uh, wetland maps and other information that's used in land use planning and, and other important uses. We also in areas that, that aren't outright protected, we work with partners to advance sustainable land, land use practices uh, and we've worked a large amount with the forest industry, but also other, other industries. And to do this, we, we often produce field guides um, and practitioner guides that help resource managers to operate in a sustainable manner in and around wetlands to ensure that they retain all the functions that support waterfowl over the long term. We also influence conservation policies across the boreal, <clears throat> excuse me, that protect waterfowl habitat. And we do a fair amount of knowledge sharing and transfer. So we have some online uh, wetland 101 courses if you're interested that you can, can sign up and learn more about wetlands within uh, their specific online training modules. But we also get out into the field with industry partners where we get our, our boots wet and, and talk about wetlands and, and industry practices uh, to maintain healthy wetlands and waterfowl populations. We are also grounded in science. Our research helps to close knowledge gaps around the boreal to support our conservation efforts and to, to guide our sustainable development programs and and also to adapt our program based on some of the research that we find so that we're always uh, based on, on the latest science. And, and sometimes it's, it's not always um, you know, Western science. We also have a number of programs where, where we're working directly with indigenous communities and the, the multiple ways of knowing to incorporate that in, information together uh, to be used to inform land use planning and other activities. And so what have we achieved through all this effort in conservation through the boreal? 
To date, we have conserved over 180 million acres of the boreal. These areas are shown in the map here as, as the green areas uh, that include protected areas and sustainable advancements in sustainable development. The areas that where we're currently working are in yellow and the areas in, in purple are the kind of remaining areas where we're looking to potentially go in, in the future. We also have jurisdictions uh, where we're working on wetland and conservation policies that conserve wetland habitat over entire provinces and territories. Like in Manitoba, where recently the boreal wetland codes of practice were, were adopted throughout all of the boreal region in Manitoba. So as you can see, there's a lot of progress, but also lots of work still to do in the boreal. Lots of important work that our team is, is uh, out there doing right now. So uh, if you have any, any questions about that, we'll maybe put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer. And we'll also answer some right after the, the panel discussion. So thank you for that. And Bev, I'll turn it over to you to show the results of the Mentimeter. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm going to hopefully you can see it on my screen. Yeah, so so Kevin, what what do you, you we see a lot of good stuff here, wetlands and trees and carbon. What's missing here? What do you think's missing? People. Yeah, yeah. and waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> millions and millions of waterfall. <laughs> That's what's missing. So hopefully, I think, uh, you know, through your presentation, people got a, a good idea of how much waterfowl is in the boreal and, and other trees or other birds as well. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks all for participating. Um, That's awesome. Hopefully you enjoyed that, too. So I will stop sharing. Thanks for doing that, Bev. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. And thanks, Kevin. Um, we do have some time for, for questions now. If anyone has any questions, please be sure to um, put them in the chat and uh, we'll uh, roll with those. Um, but I do have, I do have one, one question. Um, Kevin, what do you see as the biggest future challenge, uh, challenges or opportunities for conservation in the boreal? Well, I think that there, there are a number of challenges, but I think one of the, the most pressing challenges right now is, is climate change. I think people that are, that are maybe several of you that live in the boreal that are on the, the call right now um, are witness to a lot of the changes that are happening, the, the increased fires, uh, you know, the, the flooding recently within um, the Mackenzie Valley there, there's a bunch of, bunch of changes that are happening very rapidly and models are predicting that that will, will only continue. So it, as, as it relates to, to conservation, understanding what the impacts of those are and, and helping to figure out some, some solution mit, mitigation adaptation strategies to, to help um, not only communities, but also uh, concert, continue to advance conservation and and conserve waterfowl and clean water and all the things that we care about uh, within the context of climate change. So I think there's, uh, okay. there's a challenge there, but also an opportunity um, through a lot of the work that uh, indigenous communities are already doing through indigenous protected conserved areas and Canada's recent announcement of a goal of 30% uh, protection by 2030 uh, largely through uh, indigenous protected conserved areas and, and other areas within Canada. Uh, I think that there's an incredible opportunity to meet that challenge and, and figure out some of those solutions and strategies. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So I, I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. So maybe we'll move into the panel discussion and that'll no doubt prompt some additional engagement from our audience tonight. So Al, I'm going to begin with, with you. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about how you're using science and, and data to inform the conservation work in the boreal, especially given, you know, we talked about the vast space and the acreage that you cover. Uh, give us a little insight on that. 
Okay, thanks, Cynthia, and uh, and welcome everyone. Um, so yeah, in a boreal, um, you know, uh, Kevin uh, references it, it. You know, all we can do is influence opportunities for conservation, and through the different strategies that he spoke to, policy, advancing sustainable land use, and protection. So we work with different levels of government, including indigenous communities who own the land, and work with various industries who manage. Uh, various resources throughout many areas of the boreal landscape. So what brings us to uh, to the table, um, so to speak, is uh, you know in order to influence conservation is science, um, bringing focused and relevant information to our partners and collaborators. Um, science is the means of being able to do that. So think of it, you know, uh, without it, it's difficult to manage what you don't know. So. When we first started the boreal program about 23 years ago, there was a lot of information gaps out there. Uh, basic questions that we've had, things like, where are the wetlands? What are the different type of wetlands? Where are the waterfowl, um, the abundance, all that stuff. So uh, science was critical to kickstarting our program. So using um, science in supporting and guiding our program and being relevant to partners continues to this day as being uh, at the heart of everything we do within Ducks Unlimited and with the Boreal program. So one of the key things that we, we uh, initiated uh, with the program and continue to do so to this day are, is, is wetland mapping. Um, knowing the different types of wetlands, how they function, what, uh, what are the different ecological services that they provide. So we were fortunate when we first started the program working with Ducks Limited Inc, our sister organization who were mapping um, wetlands uh, in, in Alaska um, to, to work and partner with them to expand the work here in Canada. So we were fortunate to, uh, this is an expensive venture doing that type of work in remote areas. So we were fortunate to get funding support from various industries, from forestry, the energy industry, uh, different levels of governments and other stakeholders to initiate our mapping effort that we do. And to this day, we still continue to do that. And to date, we've mapped over 370 million acres or 150 million hectares of the boreal landscape throughout most of uh, many parts of Western Canada, but there's still a lot of work to do. So today we know that most, most of the boreal wetlands are, are very diverse. They're very, you know, they're, they're very interconnected and vegetated. A lot of them are vegetated. So think about your bogs and fens and swamps. Uh, these are wetlands that, um, you know, don't necessarily have open water components to them. So they have limited values to waterfall compared to, you know, your marsh and shallow open water systems that are more important to, uh, to waterfall. Um, but we're interested in all these different types of wetlands to conserve that are part of our mission. You might ask, well, why are we interested in, in some of these vegetated wetland types like your bogs and fans and such? Um, well, for one, they, they do provide important nesting cover for waterfall, but more importantly, these systems uh, move a, a lot of water and nutrients to the wetland systems that are more important to waterfall. So because these systems are, are highly interconnected over vast distances, um, it's important for us to be able to map these areas and understand how these systems function. Um, so, our, you know, our, our, our wetland mapping is, is, um, is based on an ecological system that was developed within Ducks Limited. It's ecologically based. And with the wetland mapping that we do, we're able to build other conservation products from that, those wetland mapping products. So you think about understanding carbon storage values. So we're bringing science to the table and being able to develop and understand the extent of, of carbon that's stored in the different wetland types and being able to work with our partners and understanding what those values are um, for, for companies that are interested in, in um, carbon accounting and such. Uh, we're also building other conservation products such as biodiversity values. Uh, a lot of our partners are interested in in species at risk. So we think about whooping cranes, uh, woodland caribou, bison, yellow rails. So our, our wetland mapping products are, are used to help model and build um, in, you know, biodiversity mapping products that are important for planning purposes as such. Um, other things too is just 
basically understanding the boreal hydrology. So knowing how these wetland functions, um, we're able to work with the industries that are, are really interested in understanding how hydrology works when they're, for, for example, when they're building roads and understanding what the risks are associated with them so we could work with them in developing better management practices and such. And, and Bev will speak to some of that work a little later. So a lot of our other work that we're, that's core to us with the science is, is understanding where the birds are, where the waterfall are. So um, we've um, you know, undertaken a lot of uh, waterfall surveys and we built waterfall distribution maps. We're understanding where the, the different uh, types of waterfall species and nesting gills exist and what their densities are. So that's an important part of our work here um, in understanding um, that type of information for planning purposes, working with our partners and such. And more recently, we've uh, our, our, our scientists have been focused on uh, directed research and learning about the potential threats of, of various industrial activities to waterfowl and their habitats. So, and, and, and understanding what those are and, and being able to mitigate those potential threats. So science is, is relevant you know, to our program, to our partners and stakeholders. And it really has positioned ducks as leaders in understanding boreal wetlands and their functions. Uh, and we share all this information that's used in, in land use planning, helping support the development and implementation of, of policies and input into protected areas planning and helping advancing sustainable land use and supporting indigenous led planning efforts. Awesome, thank you. That's, uh, I remember some of the, the early uh, caribou maps that, that we used to have, right? Where we were mapping where caribou were because they were important to, to partners. And so very interesting. Thanks, Al. Okay. Um, Bev, uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to you now to, to tell us a little bit more about how we get all that information and all that science out to, to people through the, the knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer that you focus on. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure, thanks. Yeah, so like, like what Al said, you, you can't manage and you can't conserve what, what you don't know. I also think you, you don't value what you don't know to value. So yeah, science is at the heart of everything we do at Ducks Unlimited Canada, but ultimately conservation is about people. And generally people want to do the right thing. I think everybody would prefer to be a, a con conservationist if they could, but sometimes we just, we don't know what the right thing is to do. So this is why communication, knowledge sharing is so important for conservation. It helps us figure out what the, thing, the right thing is to do. And it helps us share that understanding of why we want to conserve. So why should we value healthy wetlands? It helps us to promote an understanding of the how. So how should we make, how should we ensure that our, our wetlands are healthy in the boreal forest? And knowledge sharing is not just about us giving information, it's about us receiving it too. So our job in the boreal and in DUC as a whole is not only to collect information about waterfall and wetlands, but to share that information um, with people living and working on the land to help them make informed decisions. At the same time, we have to learn from others. So what influences their decisions on the landscape? What values do people have? What creates barriers for conservation and what creates opportunities for conservation? And like Al said, uh, we've been doing a lot of science in the boreal and now, now we have to tell people about all that science. We have to operationalize that science and we have to get the information uh, into the hands of people who can implement it. So that's what Al and I and Kevin and, and our colleagues have been doing for the last several years. And like Kevin said, this includes developing wetland field guides. And these guides are designed to help people to go out in the field and identify wetlands that they're working in. So being able to identify, being able to know that you're in a wetland is the first step to conserving them. And, and it's often like the hardest step. So sometimes boreal wetlands can be extremely hard to identify. Uh, sometimes those treed wetlands, they don't look like wetlands at all. And I remember a time being out with Al at a site in Grand Prairie, which is in Northern Alberta. And we were walking around identifying wetlands and we got to this one site and it was you know, completely dry, 
the, on the ground and it had all these big beautiful tamarack trees and some birch trees and Alice said we were in a fen and I was like it's completely dry like this is not a wetland no way so we took a peat core and sure enough there was like a meter of peat in the soil which is a good indication that you're in a peatland so yeah if you don't know that you're even in a wetland how can you conserve it so we've been doing a fair bit of knowledge uh sharing through in-person events going out in the field showing people what wetlands are talking about why they're so important um, not only for ducks, but for you know all the the benefits that they provide, and sharing ideas of about how we can conserve them. And mentioned Kevin mentioned the the Wetlands 101 course that we developed, uh, online course, and we've had over 6,000 people from across Canada and abroad register for that course. We also created a knowledge exchange, um, which is a, a community of practice uh, that we share monthly newsletters to people, and we have monthly webinars. And we're really talking about uh, boreal wet, wetland uh, BMPs for the boreal. And then through all of this work, we've been able to also partner with several high profile organizations to develop a knowledge sharing website for land managers across Canada. And that's called the Canadian Conservation and Land Matters Knowledge Network. And our partners in that include Environment uh, Canada, or I guess the Environment and Climate Change Canada now. Uh, Natural Resources Canada, uh, we've got the Northern uh, Alberta Institute for Technology and others. So it's really a place where people can get information about practices to conserve wetlands, but also some uh, information about other key conservation issues in Canada. So we've been really focusing a lot of our activities in the Boreal on knowledge exchange to translate and distill all that good science that Al was talking about into a way that people can understand and that they can use. The most important thing, you need that information so, and, and so that they can use it to conserve. Great. Yeah, that wetlands, um, your wetlands 101 with the 6,000 registrants here, I mean, that's amazing. So very exciting about that. Um, so Bev, I'm gonna stick with you and, and Kevin mentioned this earlier, but uh, can you explain a, a bit about sustainable development and how what it is and, and how we're leveraging it to advance our waterfowl conservation work. Yeah, absolutely. Sustainable development is something that I'm, I'm quite passionate about. It's what I've been really working on since I started with Ducks Unlimited. So it's really about a way of doing business that ensures uh, the environment, society, and uh, our financial economic goals can be sustained over the long run. It's about making sure the needs that we have as a society currently are met, but met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this concept you know, is relatively new in Western societies, but it is, was a way of life for indigenous societies across the world. But I think like in light of the recent economic, social, environmental crises that have shook our world, you just have to think about COVID, the public governments, corporations, investors are now really grabbing hold of this idea of sustainable development. It's, it's really becoming mainstream. So we see this uh, you know, on a focus of what's called ESG in the corporate world. Now companies are being asked to report on their environmental social governance activities so that investors can really understand how sustainable these companies are and will be in the future. And we at Ducks Unlimited have been early adopters of this approach, primarily focused on that E part of the ESG, but with an understanding that we can't achieve environmental sustainability without also achieving social and economic goals as well. So in the Boreal, um, like Kevin said, we know we can't achieve our conserva conservation objectives just through protection measures. And we know that we can't achieve them you know, on our own. We have to work together. So we've been doing a lot of work with the forest industry, uh, but with, with also mining industry and, and with our government partners to help them embrace this idea of sustainable development with of course a focus uh, on conserving wetland habitats for waterfowl. But again, for, for also all the other benefits that the wetlands provide, including carbon and water and you know, great place for moose and all that stuff. <laughs> so science is, is showing us that these forest ecosystems are really a complex interaction uh, of climate, water, trees, and, and people. So 
we know that having healthy wetland habitats means that we have also have healthy wetlands, or sorry, wet working forests, which are good for people. And really that's the message that we've been trying to share with our forestry partners and our and the governments and with the public. And you know, people get that, they really do. They, they want to support and be a part of this sustainable uh, development approach. So one example that we've been working on in relationship in relation to sustainable development is called the Forest Management and Wetland Stewardship Initiative, or what we hideously call the, the FIMWYSI. It's a, it's a terrible acronym, no one likes it, but that's, that's all we can think of. So, uh, so around 2016, we started talking to some of our long-standing forest partners about forming a group to help advance wetland conservation through sustainable forest management with a focus on working together to identify and implement practices that avoid or minimize any potential negative effects forestry has on wetlands or waterfall and, and identify you know, potential benefits that they might have as well. And in 2017, we formalized this group, uh, which consists of course of us, but also the Forest Products Association of Canada, Alpac Forest Industries, Canfor, Miller Western, Tolkal Industries, West Fraser, and warehouser company. And these are some of the biggest timber management companies in the world, really. In Canada, we are talking about millions and millions and millions of acres that they are managing. West Fraser alone manages over 8.5 hectares or 21 million acres of forests in Canada. So by working with together in this group, we really have a chance to influence conservation at a huge, huge scale. And not, not just necessarily in Canada, uh, you know, like what we do can be, can be um, used across, across North America and the world. So in our first three years of collaboration, we developed a number of reports and guides centered around developing guiding principles for wetland stewardship for forest management, and then best practices uh, for working around wetlands and, and waterfall mass. Now we're really trying to work with our forest partners to implement those practices through their whole uh, you know, chain, through planning, through operations, all of that. So really trying to mainstream these practices so that they become you know, uh, something that is day to day for them in, in the work. And our partners have really embraced the FIMWYSI, our awful acronym. They, you know, in 2020, we, we were really proud to receive an award of excellence from the Forest Products Association of Canada and recognition for the work that we're doing. So this is just one, um, and we've got a lot of other stuff to talk about. So I'm gonna stop talking and uh, we can, you know, if there's more questions, we can talk about that later. Great, okay. thanks Bev. And yeah, we do have some questions in the chat, but I, I got a couple other uh, things I wanted to, to bring up with Al and, and, and Kevin. So Al, um, mention, you mentioned earlier um, some of the policy work that we, that we do. So how does that, policy affect boreal conservation and how do we work within those multiple jurisdictions to influence policy? Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. Um, yeah, this is one of our three strategies that uh, we use to implement wetland conservation. And yeah, policy is a very important one uh, to conserve wetlands. And this requires a lot of time and investment in helping support development and implementation of. Um, so policies are, you know, uh, there's different types of policies and they're all led by, by uh, different levels of government. Um, and, and, uh, and all we could do is, is help support uh, the development of these and the implementation of the different policies. Um, so, um, you know, we know that the boreal uh, the landscape is full of wetlands and they're, they're particularly vulnerable um, throughout that so they, they do require a lot of attention and they do exist primarily on on um, crown lands as we talked about earlier and uh, appropriate policies and legislation uh, are needed to, to help guide government industry and um, and people other uh, residents and such that that uh, manage wetlands so um, you know we know that wetland policies and legislations do not necessarily protect wetlands but they're, they're an, an important part of effective wetland management to help conserve them. So we strongly support the development of wetland policies uh, throughout all these different jurisdictions in, in the country. And um, 
to help do that, we help inform these policies and this legislation uh, to conserve the, the, the boreal wetlands and waterfall habitat. And we collaborate with government programs that align with DU's waterfall conservation objectives. A couple examples that we've done here um, that I can speak to specific to, to um, wetland policies, like in Alberta here, um, there's been a wetland policy uh, throughout the settled part of the province up until 2016. There was nothing up in the boreal. So um, prior to 2016, there was a lot of work done uh, to make a, a comprehensive province-wide wetland inventory that exists now today. So, um, you know, and, and it doesn't stop there. There's always continual work um, that, we, um, that we engage ourselves with to help support different aspects of, of policies. Um, the need for continuous improvement and, and the implementation of these policies. A more recent um, um, example um, that we've uh, recently completed uh, just about a year ago now was in Manitoba, where the government, um, with a lot of support from Ducks Unlimited, we, we created a, a boreal wetlands conservation codes of practice. So this is a series of, of best management practices to help guide developers to avoid, minimize, or offset um, impacts to, to boreal wetlands. So th that'll help ensure that, there's, uh, that there is no net loss of wetlands that benefit the boreal region of Manitoba. So there's different um, um, levels of policies in different jurisdictions that we continually work to develop. And I'll, I'll cut it there because just being mindful of time. So Great. back to you, Cynthia. <laughs> Thanks, Al. And so I'm, I'm going to go to Kevin now. Um, so we work to support Indigenous-led conservation and protected areas. Can you explain a little bit why those models are so important to boreal conservation in Canada? Sure. Yeah, one of the most rewarding parts about <clears throat> my job and, and is going out and, and working with Indigenous communities often. I enjoy working with all partners, but it's, it's often... Uh, there are a lot of commonalities between um, interests in, in waterfowl and wetlands and water, um, a lot of overlapping interests and common goals. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, working with and supporting Indigenous uh, peoples in their conservation leadership, uh, I think is a really important pathway and growth for us as an organization. Um, but also in the spirit and practice of reconciliation, um, there's, there's a lot of good work to be done there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of support for Indigenous protected conserved areas and, and guardians, Indigenous guardians programs across the country. The recent federal budget that was announced created a lot of funding for support of those types of things. And like I said earlier, the, the overarching goal of Canada um, to 30% protection by 2030. But it's also important to, to remember that these are really important decisions for communities um, in the, the management of, and future of their, of their, their lands, wor working, um, you know, trying to figure out you know, what areas and, and, and all of those decisions. We're supporting that with information and supporting their decisions with uh, where the where the ducks are, where where how the water is flowing, all of those types of things, merged with um, a lot of their ways of knowing uh, into some of those products. So um, it's a really important part of what we do, and I think a big future of uh, where we're going with conservation. Awesome, thank you. Well, thank you for for all of that. We do have some some questions in the in the chat, so I'm. I'm um, going to start with Jeff, who, who asked, um, do old growth trees versus new growth in the boreal have an impact on the wetland conservation and, and, and the industry? How does that affect those factors? So does that have an impact on wetland, the conservation, the old growth versus new or reforested areas? Uh, I can answer that. And, and, sure. and you know, Kevin and Al can feel free to argue with me, we can, we can talk about it. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, the boreal forest is a dynamic place. It's, it's been a place where natural disturbance has occurred you know, through its, its entirety. It's developed because of natural disturbance. 
And that natural disturbance means that there's going to be areas of old growth and there's going to be areas of new growth all the time changing throughout right. you know every area of, of the boreal and and waterfowl and, and and wetlands have evolved through that natural disturbance dynamic so um i don't think that there's any in terms of wetland conservation as long as if we're talking about harvesting as long as it's done in a a careful and a thought out manner, which is what we're trying to do with forest industries to get them to think about wetlands and waterfall, which they, they do, they absolutely get it. Um, I don't think it really matters if it's old growth right. or new growth from, from a, a wetland and waterfall perspective, other perspectives, other other issues, but <laughs> right. Kevin and Al can argue if they, if they have something different. No, I just think it's pretty cool in the boreal that some of the oldest, oldest growth of forests they're about this tall and <laughs> yeah. in bogs and and because it's such a slow growing and over a long time and, and mitigated from the effects of fire in some cases <laughs> that you think of an old growth forest like a redwood or, or a big tree but these some of these are, are pretty tiny great. <laughs> okay great great thanks for that um donald asks with uh, with 20 percent of the forest region now covered by industrial concessions. How is that affecting efforts to preserve wildlife habitat? And I'm sure this gets to the whole sustainable development aspect. So Kevin or, or Bev, do you want, when do you want to answer that one? Sure, I think, I think, you know, the, it is, there are different parts of the boreal, like I said in the beginning, there's the kind of intact area and then the area we call the working landscape. And, we have different strategies employed in those different regions, right? In, in the more intact areas, we're working to retain the habitat through protection. Um, but in the working forest, we're adapting, like, like we talked about the policy and sustainable land use mm -hmm. pieces so that industries uh, can better operate within those areas to generate healthy economies and health, healthy local communities while doing so in a way that doesn't impact the function of the wetlands and uh, waterfowl habitat across the boreal. So right. we're working very hard to ensure that wildlife habitat is, is preserved even in those working landscapes. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, so Pat asks, can you share how our science has evolved over the past few decades in the boreal? Uh, so we hear of strategies or techniques that we once used that are now out of favor. Um, can you expand on that a, a little bit? And I think that's probably not only true in the boreal, but in the rest of our science work too, right? It's continually evolving. Yeah, I could uh, speak to you a little bit to your start. Um, yeah, it, we're always needing to adapt. I mean, technology always change. And, and uh, for example, just back to the wetland mapping with remote sensing, that mm -hmm. whole discipline, it's, uh, you know, there's different satellite sensors, you know, deployed over, you know, more recently with higher resolution imagery that we can uh, do better mapping, um, um, you know, implement those different technologies to create more high resolution products that it, that, that uh, is more detailed and such. So, so it's, it's always evolving and, and, uh, and even our, our science priorities, the research side of things, you know, we're closing those gaps. So we still have a lot of, uh, of questions and um, you know, working uh, with, with other researchers and academics and stuff to help close those information gaps. So it's, it's, right. it's an ongoing effort. Okay. We're just getting better at it. You know, in the history of, our, of ducks, 83 years of history, you know, the boreal program has been, been around just a shorter time period. We still have a lot of catch up to do there. So, right, right, right. Great. And so, kind of further to that, um, Mike Anderson, hey, Mike, um, asks, uh, he's curious about your general experience in trying to bridge the gaps between the Western view of science and traditional knowledge. Um, do you have any general advice on how? Uh, some approaches that you've been able to use that that makes that be more productive. Yeah, maybe I can tackle that one. Um, hi, Mike. Good to good to have you here tonight. Um, I think it's important. One of the big big ways that, that working with it's just understanding working within what we 
call it what has become known as an ethical space. So uh, where all ways of knowing are respected and valued uh, together and, and that there are different pieces of that and working within that, that system in general really helps to incorporate you know, the, the data and information that, that we collect along with the, the knowledge that indigenous peoples and, and others have had being out on the landscape for and being stewards of, of the landscape for millennia really. And, and there's a lot of uh, important knowledge and, and understanding there that, that we can bring together with, you know, to inform things like, like the land use land relationship plans that are being established and some of the planning efforts that are going on and in incorporating that, that um, those methodologies. The, we're also in partnership with a number of social scientists that, that are looking at that kind of technically and specifically um, because we don't have a lot of background that within DU, at least not currently. So we leverage those partnerships through other uh, researchers that are working through some of those things and, and working with communities in that way. Yeah, if I could jump in, I yeah. totally agree with everything that Kevin said, but. I think where, where we have found to be the most productive is having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, face-to-face -face, face -face conversations with people out in the wetlands, where we talk, you know, we look at the plants, we talk about this is, you know, this is our scientific name for the plant, and what, what do you call this plant, and what are your uses, and having those discussions being face-to-face -face is by far the most productive. I mean, it's not the easiest, but it, if you're Great. talking strictly productive, I would say that's the most productive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we've, had, we've had programs where we've um, gone out into the field, you know, with, with youth and elders um, talking about, you know, sharing knowledge both ways, right? Like talking about, you know, the what we're seeing say from satellites and things like that. And they'll tell us, well, how, this is how it's changed from our viewpoint over time. And that really helps us to better map those areas and better understand those areas and be, um, I guess, more connected in many ways to, right. to conservation outcomes. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've only started to just do a little bit of reading on the ethical space concept. It's very, very interesting. No doubt helpful in, in much of our work. So the next question is for, for Al. Um, so Greg Weeks asks, uh, you refer to the work that we do as products. Um, are we actually doing that work? Is that a fee-for-service kind of work? Do we do that? It, it varies. So yes. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, with working with, um, with Parks Canada, uh, they approached us and, and, and asked us to uh, undertake mapping efforts throughout Wood Buffalo National Park. So this is uh, an area that's a national park, it's protected. So, you know, we, um, we had to approach it through, through the fee-for-service uh, opportunities. So, um, because normally, you know, we would just wouldn't do that with the other resources that we have to map an area that's protected. So, um, and then with... You know, in, in other areas, we uh, we work with our our, um, we, our our other partners, whether the forestry, energy, or, or governments, where they help you know collectively fund the uh, you know mapping efforts in other areas that might not necessarily be a fee for service opportunity to to raise those unrestricted dollars. So it varies. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we've got uh, one last question from Jennifer. Uh, so she's. Uh, commenting on the idea of carbon storage uh, coming up in a number of different areas and this is a is is this a way to monetize the value of the boreal in a different way than resource extraction to help people see that the value of conservation the value of that vast amount of carbon stock I know that's probably like we could talk about that for hours <laughs> yeah it's a master class I think it's yeah. uh yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a big carbon vault. There's more carbon stored below ground than above ground. And most of the research, you know, to date has been understanding the carbon values above ground. So, right. um, so with our wetland mapping products, we know where the, where the wetlands are, the different type of wetlands. 
and we're able to collect information spatially and uh, reference information, understand peak depth and, and density to come up with calculations that we apply to the mapping product to spatially understand the extent and volumes of carbon. So that brings, you know, fulfills that information gap that we were able to work with our partners and understanding, you know, uh, uh, carbon budgets and such. Right. Okay. And we're also looking into the, I, I think you started to get at that, Jennifer, in your question around basically a conservation economy um, through carbon. So we are looking at yeah. some of those opportunities. It's pretty early days. Uh, a lot of the carbon, say, offset projects and that are sold either voluntary or through regulatory markets, um, you know, it's, it's early days figuring out how that applies within, within the boreal. Uh, we're starting to look at it within the forestry management and potentially the peatland management um, sort of aspects. But yeah, there are ways that you can monetize carbon values to provide economies for communities and potentially governments mm -hmm. in a different way than the sort of resource extractive economies, based economies. So there are a number of jurisdictions that are looking into those opportunities right now. And we're supporting the information base in the way Al, Al mentioned. Great, awesome. Well, thank you all uh, very much. Great questions uh, tonight. and. And so just to Al and Bev and, and Kevin, thank you very much for, for taking the time out of uh, your busy schedules to uh, share some of your knowledge with the group tonight. Uh, our amazing staff, uh, you know, never ceases to amaze me and, and the work in the boreal is really um, very interesting. Your dedication to, to wetland and waterfowl conservation is, is great. And please do keep up the, the good work. I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to look at the chat, but a uh, couple of comments similar to that. So thank you for all of that. And and to our audience, uh, again, we really appreciate your being able to take time out of your busy schedules to, to spend some time with us. I really do look forward to seeing all of you in person again sometime soon. Um, and for, for now, we'll, we'll continue on Zoom, but uh, it'd be great to see you in person. And, and thank you for all that you do for conservation. Uh, hope you all have a fabulous evening that you stay well and healthy and uh, look forward to a great summer. And please do check out uh, the YouTube channel um, and feel free to, to reach out to us anytime if you have questions. Uh, I think it was posted in the, the email at stewardship at ducks.ca if you want additional information. So thank you all very much. Have a fabulous evening and safe travels to wherever it takes you next. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Canada's boreal forest. It's a vital ecosystem that touches all of our lives. It stores carbon, filters air, and helps regulate our climate. And it's home to the largest area of intact wetlands in the world. Critical habitat for millions of animals and plants. It's time to help us conserve Canada's boreal forest.